today we're going to do part two of that exchange. And I believe that there's some exchanges that God still wants to do with us. And so I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 61 uh, in a minute. But I want to talk to you about an exchange that, um, that I and my wife, that gorgeous woman that was singing over here right there, um, we have been in the United States since, what is it, 2002? 2002. In 2002, we migrated from Canada to the United States. And one of the things that we had to do is actually um, do an exchange, the Canadian dollar with the American dollar. Well, at the time that we actually came to the United States, the American economy was booming. And the Canadian economy was dragging. And so in order for me to buy a single U.S. dollar, I had to pay a dollar fifty-seven Canadian. Everybody say, whoa. Yeah. That was not a good deal. It was not a good deal. In fact, we tried in some ways to see, you know, who's got the better rate yeah, it just there was no better rate anywhere. It was just it was just a bad deal. There is an exchange that takes place when we come to God. And Isaiah 61, that we're gonna put up right now, says this it's the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captive and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Verse 2, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Verse 3 says, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them, and here is the exchange, a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. That they may be called oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall... Repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. Now, this text in Isaiah <clears throat> is actually written against the backdrop of approximately 600 years of slavery and captivity for the people of Israel. That was a long time. Now, we also know in our current context that we have been brought into the kingdom of God from ourselves, our own slavery, not to a nation, but to sin, right? He has brought us into the kingdom of God to give us life and freedom. Now, last week, or last time we were together, two weeks ago, we talked about an exchange that takes place in our lives when we let go of our hurts, of our pain, of our things of the past, you know, getting rid of unforgiveness. We get rid of resentment. We get rid of those things that just hold us back. And if you recall, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, we had a couple of crosses that we screwed into the stage. And, uh, And all of you guys that were here had made an exchange. You wrote down what are those situations, those people that have hurt you. Those things that have impacted you to a degree where you felt paralyzed and held down and held back. And we wrote those and we stuck them on the cross, symbolically saying, hey, you know what? I'm leaving that at the foot of the cross. I don't want to carry that burden. I don't want to be angry anymore at that person. I don't want to be upset at my son or daughter or cousin or mom, dad, grandpa, whoever that might be, that person that hurts you, that situation that frustrates you. I don't want that anymore in my life. You see, God is masterful at exchanging what those things that trip us up, 
the things that cause us to stumble, all that other stuff, right, that is not as important, that takes us away from focusing on God and the frustrations and the irritations that we currently experience and that are sometimes, in, in some cases, constant frustrations and things that just hold us back. I don't know, maybe this morning when you were coming to church, maybe you experienced some of those frustrations in the, in the car with your wife or children. You know, it always, I don't know about you, but I mean, my wife and I have experienced that so many times. Good, my kids are here. I was just only my son back there. Uh, <clears throat> but we have experienced that a few times. You know, you go into church and you just full of joy and excitement, all of a sudden they start screaming in the back and, you know, they're getting irritated at each other, pulling each other's hair. And it's like the last thing that I want is for like, for this, all these irritations to happen when I'm going to church. I need to come to church to have peace, right? So that I can worship God like we did today. Please stop. Please. You know, those irritations happen to us all the time. Maybe it's that irritating coworker that sits next to you and has one of those habits that just, you know, you just don't need in your life. I know that uh, with COVID, everyone's been working from home, which is, you know, a positive thing. But then there's like the irritation of being with the same person or persons in your household. How about that for about a year, right? Nobody wants to talk about that. Do not elbow the person next to you. I'm watching. God's peace is powerful in the middle of our irritations and our frustrations and disappointments. And I believe that God wants to teach us the secret of a victorious life. And that comes from making some exchanges. And so last week, we, last time we were here, we made that exchange. Today, we're going to talk about three other exchanges that the Word of God encourages us. And they're all found in verse 3 that we had read. Number one, we exchange a crown of beauty instead of ashes. A crown of beauty instead of ashes. We read it, it calls it a headdress of beauty, right? It's a crown. It's a crown. Now, generally speaking, when you think of ashes, you think of death, you think of Mourning, you think of sadness, you think of sorrow, discouragement, etc., etc. But in the Old Testament, there's also reference uh, to ashes as being something that displays a different thing. It's not sadness or mourning or desolation and devastation, but it's actually a symbol of our humility before God. In Daniel uh, chapter 9 and verse 3 is one of those examples. When Daniel, during a time of praying before God, he went to the Lord in humility. And he was basically praying for the sins of the people of Israel. And the Bible says that he covered himself in, he dressed himself in sackcloth and covered himself in ashes. Symbolic of saying, God, I see what. Your people have done. And I am praying that you will forgive them. He stood in the gap for them in humility. Now at times, all of us, I think, each and every one of us, we, have, we can have a tendency to be satisfied with living a life of you know, feeling a little dejected, discouraged, as if God were not even part of our lives. And that's okay. We accept that. And we should not. There's a story in the Bible about the son of Jonathan. His name was Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth got himself into a place where he was satisfied living alone. He was a crippled man. He felt like he was dejected, discouraged, that no one cared for him. No one even wanted to be with him. And so he lived in this city called Lodabar. And Lodabar literally means an insignificant place, a place of no inheritance. In the middle of nowhere. You can literally translate it. Lodabar, in the middle of nowhere. But that's not our God. That's not what God is like. You see, the enemy comes to us. We struggle many times with the same thoughts. 
The same conversations that go on in our minds. You're worthless. You're not good enough. You have to do this in order to be good enough. You're not going to measure up. You don't measure up to that person. You don't measure up to your sister, to your brother, to your cousin. To You don't measure up to your best friend. You know what? God does not compare us to other people. That's not the way God operates. The enemy whispers lies. After all, I mean, why would God even care for you? Look at you. You're a mess. You can't get it together. Now, I've had those voices in my head in my life at some point. I don't know about you, but I've heard those voices. I'm sure you have too at some point. If we can all be honest. But you know what? It doesn't matter what we think of us, of ourselves. What matters is what God says about us and what He declares about who we are as His sons and daughters. Now, we come to church and we get into an atmosphere of singing and praise and worship and it's just so good. And then the enemy comes with all that self-talk that goes on in our heads. How can you raise your hand and worship God? I mean, come on. You had a rotten week this week. You remember all the yelling with your wife, with your husband, with your friends. You got ticked off at your parents and all that stuff. And thank God that we have great bathrooms in church, right? What are you talking about? Because, you know, that's a great place to disappear during worship. Just go there for 10, 15 minutes. Just hang out. Say hi to everybody that comes in. You have conversations. Come on. You've done it. I've done it. But God today is calling us to make an exchange. He wants to exchange the ashes of disappointment and defeat with a crown of beauty. And like David did with Mephibosheth when he called him and he welcomed him to sit at his table and to eat because he was royalty. That is what God wants to do with each and every one of us. Now, ashes also are a result of a fire, right? And I don't know if any of you have had a fire, that you've experienced a fire in your home. I hope none of you have. But usually, you know, a fire leaves devastation behind you. And you know, I was thinking, um, think for a moment, you know, you go and visit, uh, you, you see this home, you're, you're in the market for a house, and you see this beautiful home, on the outside looks gorgeous, you make an appointment with a realtor, you go in, and, and you know, you see the beautiful rooms, bathrooms, with jacuzzi, you know, counter, marble countertops, beautiful kitchen, I mean, like, you know, that embedded stove, whatever you call it, I have no idea what that's called, but it's like, in, you know, embedded in the wall and just like so fancy, you got that middle grill, and, and then you step outside and you got like this gorgeous deck with like, you know, you have the embedded barbecue, and, and you got the little pizza uh, oven, made, you know, brick oven, it's like, oh, wow, man, I want this house, I want it so bad. You know, I, I wish I had a house like that. Uh, <clears throat> I want that so bad. I want all those amenities, all those cool things. That is just so awesome. And so you make an appointment and, and, and you know, you just want to put an offer down. And then the next day, you, you're all excited with your wife. You can barely sleep at night. You're just so excited to get that house. You drive through and there's yellow tape around the property. The house burned to the ground. What a terrible thing. Our lives many times are a picture of that home. We allow the circumstances of life to come and just like destroy us on the inside. The enemy comes and he doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about you know about God. He doesn't care about you, how much Bible you have read. He doesn't care how many scriptures you've memorized. He doesn't care if your father is a pastor of a church. Or he's, a, he's a member of a great ministry. There's no care whatsoever. He wants, he delights in destroying. 
That is what he has come for. The Bible says that his purposes and his goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. Destroy. Destroy like that house. I want you to know this morning that God is never the author of our ashes. I want to make sure that we understand that today. God is not the author of your frustrations. He is not the author of your circumstances. Those, all those negative, ugly circumstances that you live. <clears throat> God is not the author of those. He tempts no one with evil, the Bible says, right? But we know one thing that we have to do as believers. We must resist the devil. We must resist him because it's only when we resist him that he will flee from us. James chapter 4 verse 7 says. But also there's another scripture in Isaiah 59 that I love. And I don't have it uh, on, the, on the wall for you guys or on the, um, on the projection. But uh, Isaiah 59 and verse 19 says that when the enemy comes in like a flood. When the enemy comes in like a powerful force that wants to sweep away everything that is good in your life and just leave you in devastation. You know what? The Bible says that the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against them. God will put up a wall and say, no way. Stop. There's a standard here. And it's not what you want to do. We need to take a stand against the works of the enemy who wishes to destroy our lives. God wants to replace those ashes in your life and my life today. He wants to remove those disappointments that we may have gone through. Disappointments, you know, are another way to say it, are missed appointments. Those missed appointments in your life with new appointments, with joy, with praise, and not sorrow. <clears throat> Number two. God's exchange is oil of gladness instead of mourning. We talked about the ashes. We do away with ashes. Now we're doing away with mourning. The oil of gladness for mourning. Now, oil in the Bible <clears throat> was used to refresh the skin, but also to refresh the soul. And it included a soothing and calming of irritations and things that, that were part of the elements of external elements. An example of that <clears throat> is when um, uh, Jesus talked about uh, fasting. In Matthew chapter 6, it talks about the fact that if you are fasting, don't look like you're about to die. You know, get some oil and anoint yourself, right? In other words, <clears throat> that oil will refresh you. It will cause you to look a little better, right? Now, when you look at the history of Israel, 600 years in slavery, there's a lot of reasons for them to mourn. When you think about it, they had been enslaved. Their crops had been taken away from them. Their wives and children were taken to another master to be slaves. They had been devastated and ravaged by the Babylonians, but the devil's purposes to enslave did not exactly result in what they wanted. And you know, the devil wants to do that with us, right? He wants to enslave us in the same way as the people, uh, the Babylonians did with the people of Israel. Now, you think about your life, what is it that can enslave us? There's, a, there's habits that can enslave us. There are uh, disappointments that we talked about that can hold us back and hold us down. It could be a lifestyle that we're trying to maintain. Maybe an addiction to work. We got to work, 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 work so that we can just pay for that luxury car and the boat and the house and the house at the beach and the vacation every couple of months because we got to keep up with the Joneses. And then, you know, there's, there's a, an image that we're trying to project. It could be, you know, you say, are you against good things? I'm not. You know, I'm not against all good things. But anytime anything becomes something that is so powerful that directs 
your life, you become a slave to. Anything that you become a slave to becomes a condition of the heart. And so, again, the devil's point is to bind us to disappointments and discouragements to situations that we encounter. And so, in Psalm 43, verse 5, David said to himself, self-talk is a good thing in this particular case. He said, why are you so downcast? Oh, my soul. Why are you so discouraged? Put your hope in God and bless his name. Put your hope in God. In Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27, it says this, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. The anointing oil. is that oil of joy instead of mourning that God wants to give us. So the oil of joy. What is this oil of joy? Joy is something that's very important in our lives as believers. Joy is a spontaneous emotion of extreme happiness, and it is expressed in visible and external manifestations during special occasions like festivals, feasts, weddings. You would see joy, people very joyful. But this joy in the Bible is also seen, check this out, at the overthrow of one's enemy. Now, that is very important. And at that overthrow, it was accompanied by very similar response and reaction as we actually have seen, we see in weddings and, and celebrations. It was accompanied by singing, by instruments, and dancing. Now, here's an example. Miriam, what did she do after they crossed the Red Sea? She grabbed the tambourine, and she started dancing, and she said, you know, this is an old song. Maybe you've never heard it. But she started saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he is trying. You know that song? Gloriously, the horse and rider, the sea. Oh, some of you know it. It's an oldie. She started singing and dancing and excited and joyful. Wow, they, look at what God has done. You know, they had an army of, Israel, of, of Egyptians coming against them. And all of a sudden, the walls of the Red Sea just fell on them. That was victory. That was celebration. Now, um, joy is something that I believe we should experience when we think of God's goodness, when we think of His grace, when we compare to the life that we have had away and alone without God, to the life that we have now, a life with God, a life of joy, that should give us excitement. That should give some joy. That should put some fire inside our belly. Because you know what? Life without God is an empty and void life. Now, you may think, well, you know, I can replace those moments of joy with other things that you might become slave to. I mean, that's your call. I would rather take the joy of the Lord. And I would rather receive what He can give. You can experience happiness that is dependent on things. But we have something that God wants to give us and is that joy that does not depend on the outside stuff, but it's something that God Himself gives us. There is nothing like the joy that we experience when we come together and we worship God, we praise God, we give Him glory because He is worthy to, be received, to receive glory and honor. We were created to be in relationship, guys, and outside of God and outside of a relationship, that we have with him, nothing else really truly matters. I, the only other thing that I can think of is my relationship with my wife, my children, my family. But that's what really, really truly matters is my vertical relationship with God. That is the most important thing. We were created 
for that relationship. So today we can focus on our ashes. We can listen to the father of lies. Or we can just choose to praise God. And receive that oil of joy into our lives. And not allow circumstances to dictate how we operate, how we function, and what we're going to do. But let God and His presence give us victory in the circumstances that we live. <clears throat> you know, um, in the Old Testament, when soldiers would go to war, the celebration that they would have at night is actually where the word, you know, we talk about dancing in the Bible. That actually originated with soldiers. What are you talking about? Soldiers would get together around the campfire at night. And they would talk to each other about how they had you know, defeated the enemy. Oh, you know what? I had like two of them coming to my right and to my left. And I took my sword and my dagger on the other side. And when he came and I stuck him on the other side and then I grabbed him on the other side and then there was another one coming back and I just kicked him and, oh. They're just like, you know, all those gestures, all those movements. That's actually how dancing originated in the Old Testament. That's the truth. That is a celebration of victory that God wants us to experience. That's why when we come to church, I don't know about you, if you're new here, you've probably heard a lot of singing and a lot of loud voices during singing. And we love to yell and scream and whistle and praise God. Because you know what? The Bible says, let everything that has breath, what? Oh, that was weak. Let everything that has breath, what? Praise, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There's victory when we praise the Lord. Our third exchange <clears throat> is the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. I want us to read Psalm 47 together. You ready? Let's go. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared a great king over all the earth. He subdued people under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. Selah is just pause. God has given, gone up with a shout. The Lord with a shout, sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Wow. Can we put our hands together for God? He is an awesome king. He is an awesome king. That is, in essence, a practical definition of what praise is. And what we are called to do. God has subjected the enemies under our feet. And you know what? The enemy can be in one or two places. Here, in our heads, Paul says that we need to what? Capture every thought, every imagination. Or it can be where? Under our feet. The choice is ours. The choice is ours. That's where he belongs. He belongs under our feet. That, mean, that is a place of authority that we have over him. And not him having a place of authority over our thought patterns in our lives. God desires to give us the garment of praise to replace this faint spirit or a spirit of heaviness, as we have probably heard the song, songs about it before. Spirit here is actually the word breath, but it also refers to a mindset, to the mind, right? And so it sounds like to me, when you really take this verse, when you take the concept of praise 
in the presence of God, that you can actually use praise and praising God as a, uh, a, um, uh, a, an antidote to depression. Instead of popping a pill, pop a song into your car and begin to praise God. I know some of you are almost there. But you know what? Instead of going after this advice and this counselor and that other counselor, you know, I'm not saying the counselors are bad. What I'm saying is that try also this. Begin to praise God. When you feel discouraged, praise God. When you feel like you're down, praise God. When you feel like life has just become so heavy on your shoulders, praise God. Praise Him. What have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? You may actually get on the other side of your frustrations having a victorious life. A faint spirit is a heavy, feeble, and a weak mindset. And it can be what we need to do. That is to praise Him in order to let this frustration and depression and heaviness dissipate and disappear. No matter how weak, no matter how feeble you think you are, or how heavy your mind and your thoughts might be, today I want you to know that God is not looking at you and says, you are not good enough. You cannot achieve a, uh, a victory because of, look at all the thoughts that you have. I mean, God, you know, it's amazing, right? If, if for some reason there would be, somebody was telling me about a movie uh, a recent movie that came out where all the men that live in a village, their thoughts are actually can be read and understood by people. Oh, that's a scary thought. Can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine if you could read my thoughts right now and I could read your thoughts? I mean, is he done yet? <laughs> is a roast in the oven? You know what? It doesn't matter where you might have been and the difficulties that you experience in your life. It doesn't matter the challenges that you feel and how dejected you might feel on the inside. Because you know what? In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 3, I love this verse. It's always been one of my favorite. It says, a bruised reed, it will not break. And a faintly burning wick, it will not quench. God is not ever going to put you out because you don't measure up exactly to the way that other people think you should or that perhaps in your own mindset you think you should have a level of spirituality. God will never shut you down. He receives you just as you are. And despite the way you might feel today, you must choose to praise God no matter what. Renewal comes when we allow our minds to be transformed in the presence of God. That's when the renewal comes. The transformation and the renewing of our minds is a process. And it's a process that we must embrace together. But while we are embracing the process, don't stop praising God. If you feel down and you begin to praise Him and you feel better, but then thoughts come the next hour, don't stop praising Him. Do it despite the way you feel. Because there's victory in that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18 says to give thanks in, not for, but in all circumstances. Now think of Paul and Silas. I think of these two men that had been put in jail. And when we talk about jail in the Bible, we're not talking about you know, first grade penitentiary in, in the United States with flat screen TVs, gourmet food, and lots of fun. We're talking about men that were probably possibly chained to a, a couple of stones that were their bed with, I don't know what was on, maybe some hay. And maybe sweaty. There was no air conditioning back then. Sweaty, bruised, cut. 
But you know, something happened to these guys. The Bible says that in the midnight hour, all of a sudden, these two guys that were like down and discouraged perhaps, <clears throat> something happened in their spirit. They began to praise God. They began to sing. And I don't know what took place. Maybe in heaven, the angels of God started looking down and said, Oh, wow, look at our servants. Paul and Silas, oh, they started to praise God. So maybe the angels started dancing and started getting excited and maybe singing the same song. I don't know, perhaps that caused that earthquake. And that earthquake that took place, the cells started shaking and their shackles came undone. I want you to know that when you begin to praise God, you never know what shackles are going to come undone out of your life. Those habits, those things that you have not been able to have victory over, shackles will fall when you begin to praise God. You've been looking for answers outside of God. But you know what God is saying? If you praise me, I will cause those shackles. I will destroy those habits. My anointing will give you the freedom that you need. You know, you might look at me today and say, well, you know, that's not my background. I got to tell you, you know, I just, you know, I come, I was raised this way. and Well, you know what? I got I to gotta tell you something. I've read this book a few times cover to cover, and I've never read the word denomination here or church background. Have you? I think that when the Bible says we got to praise God, we have got to praise Him like the Bible says. Not the way that we feel, not the way that we were instructed to. We got to do it the way the Bible says. And the Bible is a lot more radical, I want you to know, than what you might have seen here today. And I pray that we get more radical. It's okay to get radical. Because you know what? It was like 12 radical men that changed the world for Jesus. Oh, you're preaching now, David. I'm encouraging myself in the Lord. That's what David did, right? Come on. The answer is on the other side of your praise and on my praise to God. You know, the word praise is a powerful word in the Hebrew. It's a word halal. And it means to sing praise, to brag and to boast. I love that. To brag and to boast. Because you know what? That same illustration of the soldiers as they were bragging and boasting about their victory and what they had accomplished and how they had defeated the enemy and they were just dancing and getting all excited. You know what? It says same thing. We brag and we boast about our God. That's what David was talking about when he opened this morning. That we have an awesome God. We boast about Him. We brag about Him because of what He has done. What He has done. What is your life? Great. Perhaps you come from a beautiful background. You've had a rosy life. You've been eating out of a golden spoon, and that's wonderful. I'm happy for you. I did not grow up that way. My dad was a rough dude, and I grew up seeing that in my life. And then when I saw him come to Jesus, boy, that changed me. That was like, man, I want what he got, whatever that is. And I want you to know that no matter what your background, no matter what you have been and what you have done, God accepts you just as you are. And it doesn't really matter to Him where you come from. Prayer. When we prayed that prayer and we said, God, I need you in my life. He came in. Well, you know what? You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And now you praise Him a little bit different. And you don't regard people around you. You just do it because He is awesome. Let me finish with this. In Psalm 8 and verse 2, it says that out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and to still the avenger. Now, you know, we've, de we've dedicated babies, and I still see some little babies around here. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, when babies have a problem, they will let you know. Right? They will let you know. 
If they're hungry, and if they got a dirty diaper, you can see it dead on the outside. Don't ask your wife. They'll scream. They'll try to get your attention because it's important to them. You are in the business of solving problems for your children at that very young age. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, for children, hunger and a dirty diaper is a problem. What's your reaction when things don't go so well? What's your reaction when there are problems happening around you in your life? You know, um, for those of you Enneagrammers, I'm a three-wing two that goes into an ugly nine in distress. That just means that I close myself inwardly. I turn on the TV and say, leave me alone. I won't talk to anybody today. But you know what, regardless of what Enneagram type you might be, three, two, one, whatever, you know, the Bible says here in this verse that the praise stills the avenger. Praise stills the avenger. That word still is actually a military term that means to call the enemy to attention, to call someone to attention. Like a drill sergeant, when we begin to praise God, we call our uh, circumstances to attention. We call the enemy to attention and we say, I'm not listening to you. I'm praising him. I'm not doing what you're suggesting. I'm going to do what the word of God says. I am not going to continue being angry and bitter and frustrated. I'm going to be sweet and gentle and kind and do what the Bible says I need to do. There is power in praise. Remember Jericho. The walls came down. Because of the praise of God's people. And if we choose to praise Him, the walls around us will come down as well. I'm going to call the band to come, uh, to start coming up again. And <clears throat> there are four things that result from that exchange. I'm not going to mention them all, but I want to focus on quickly on two of them as the uh, band comes up. Number three, well, number one, we're called to be trees of righteousness. It's not our righteousness, but God's righteousness. Solidity. We're rooted in Him. We're called to be the planting of the Lord, to display the fruit of God's goodness. But number three, we are called to be brokers and representatives of the glory of God. To be brokers and... You say, how do I broker God's glory? Well, you know what? You can talk to somebody that is not feeling well, that needs a touch from God, you can talk to them and lead them to salvation. Or right in the middle of lows, if they talk to you, you can just grab them and lay hands on them, pray for their sickness. They get healed. Let me ask you a question. Will they be more persuaded because of you praying for them and them getting healed? Or by you giving them the four spiritual laws of salvation? We are called to be brokers and to represent His glory. And then lastly, we're called to be builders and repairers of lost people. We are all called to a powerful ministry called the ministry of reconciliation. We bring people that are lost to find Jesus in their lives. And so I pray today that that is what we decide to do. That we don't let the enemy convince us otherwise, but that we follow what the Bible says. You know, in this little old Presbyterian church, there was this lady, old Betty. And old Betty was a sweet woman. But when the pastor would begin to preach and the songs, were, she, was just, she would get so excited. The pastor would be preaching. He would say, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And one day, this sweet Presbyterian pastor went up to sweet old Betty and said, Betty, I, you know, that really disrupts my flow when you scream. Can you do me a favor and just not do that? And I'll make a deal with you. Because the winter is coming and old Betty was an older and, and not very, um, uh, very rich woman. She was a poor woman. 
pastor said, I'm going to give you two brand new blankets to keep you warm in the winter. Wow, old Betty was excited. She's like, okay, I'll do that. I'll be quiet. And so old Betty, service after service after service, she was like, she was just eternalizing all this praise. She wanted to scream, but she just couldn't. So she would just suppress it. And I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to be quiet. I got these blankets. Yeah, I'm nice and warm. I'm going to stay quiet. But then one day the pastor made a mistake. He invited this fiery preacher. And that fiery preacher took the stage and he started declaring the word of God and started preaching. I mean, he was like preaching a storm. And old Betty just couldn't handle it anymore. She just got up. She looked at her pastor and said, Pastor, blankets or no blankets. She went, hallelujah, praise the Lord. She just couldn't take it anymore. I don't know about you. I don't know what circumstances are going on in your life. But you know what? Circumstances or no circumstances. Challenges and frustrations or, ch or no challenges and no frustrations. Today, if we choose to praise the Lord from the bottom of our hearts, He will give us the victory that we deserve as His children.